Chairs here today. Hi, Jake. How are you? <laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this really beautiful Friday morning in the 1st of December, 2023. This is uh, one of our most popular programs, Fireside Forestry, Civil Culture Q&A with Bob Seymour and Jessica Lay. Um, Bob is a retired professor with, um, with the University of Maine um, School of Forest Resources and Jessica is a current professor. So we have some great knowledge. They're also woodland owners themselves, own uh, multiple par parcels in the state and are learning as they're continually learning through their own experiences. So you, a wonderful mix of, of you know, years of experience um, in the institution uh, with institutional knowledge and then hands-on experience. So this is a great opportunity for woodland owners to ask their questions, get a conversation going, learn more about what they're experiencing, and also be assured that you're not messing up. That's Bob's, I know Bob and Jessica are very good at saying, you know, try things, don't worry about messing up. And if you mess up, you learn from it and you move on. So well, I hold myself to high standards. I'm not sure. And the students, I think, could testify that I had that uh, reputation with them as well. Well, yes, you have high standards for yourself. But you yeah. uh, also Bob's a columnist. He writes every month in our newsletter. And there's a lot of times in your newsletter, Bob, that you say, I did go in thinking one thing and I, I did yeah. write it and realized mm, not exactly what I thought. And I learned. And that's that's the, my opening story for this session. If you want to start would be of yeah. that nature. How about that? Perfect. <laughs> so um, again, um, this is uh, an hour long program. Um, and this is being recorded, so for folks who don't aren't able to make it, we'll have a chance to watch it later. Um, and then also, um, please feel free to jump in um, if you have a question and um, or or send a chat. I do have. Um, I will be accessing. I'll be following people's comments on on chat. Um, and I would say that. Bob, if you or Jessica want to just start with an intro and then open it up, uh, we'd love to hand yeah. the mic over to you folks. So thank you very much for being with us. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. We've been doing this, what, for three and a half years now. It's hard to believe, but then uh, yeah. it's one of those Watch COVID them. legacies that we've retained, thank God. Uh, we got shed of a lot of them for good riddance, but so we, Jess and I were a month ago or so, a little over that, we were at a carbon uh, silviculture conference in Massachusetts, where I was invited to give a talk on the silviculture uh, of carbon, along with Ali Kasiba, who's the carbon forester for the Vermont Extension now. That's on my YouTube channel. The videos were just posted. Um, and Ali talked about the principles. I talked, I gave three case studies from Wikipedia Woods about the real carbon footprint of, of three three of our, uh, what, 12 stands, I guess, there, uh, based on uh, me re-measurements and this and that. And um, you can watch this. It's uh, And I realized that, you know, that we had not really thought at all about carbon. My, we were thought about all the traditional values of managing when we laid out that timber sale in 2017, I guess it was. Carbon was not really one of the issues. And in, in, and in, and I gave myself a mixed report card. One of the three stands especially that we treated, I think I now in hindsight cut a little bit too heavily, right? It looks good and it, by all the old measures, it, it's in good shape uh, from a timber standpoint, it's regenerating, but we could have left more carbon and, and had a much quicker recovery period. I, in the process of doing this talk, I came up with a concept of the carbon recovery time that's the, the metric by which you, the, the residual stand that you leave after a partial harvest, how long does that take before you grow back to the same carbon stocking in terms of carbon um, that you had when you started? And this, this case was uh, like 25 or 30 years, and that includes carbon stored. I included that as well. So this is a long story, but I'm just saying that that, that could have been a shorter period. I think I'd like to see that number be around 10 or 15 years, right, in a more conservative harvest, which it was in other cases. But 
So I, you know, again, live and learn, and uh, you know, we'll we'll continue to offer that. The carbon is, of course, the new thing everybody's thinking about because we can also sell it. Like the, I'll, you know, I'll stop there. I guess, Jess. Uh, we we're gonna we can put the did I did you get the I sent the link to all these videos. Yep. We can put that in the chat. Um, yeah. So I put help. in the chat right now. I put Bob's okay. YouTube channel for everybody, and that the ver the um, most recent videos are. Uh, from this carbon workshop that we were at. I'm, I'll also put in the direct link to the Northeast Civil Culture Institute, which was the official name of, of this workshop we were at. And they have those videos, including uh, more than Bob's talk at Bob and Allie's talk uh, that you can you can access. So it's uh, the, there, there's a lot of material on that Northeast Civil Culture Institute, but for those that want uh, to, to put in that sort of time on uh, advanced civil culture stuff, that is that is a good resource. It's all out there. This used to be behind a paywall. Uh, I encouraged Charlie Levesque, who maintained this, to make it free, and he has now done that. And it's this is this is actually days and days of content of training that I and many other New England civil culturists uh, produced and recorded as part of in-person training back in 2017 and 18. Um, and it's now free. It includes indoor sessions, webinar kinds of lectures, and field sessions, all of which were recorded. So, um, yeah. and there, it's organized by forest types: spruce fir, northern hardwood, oak, uh, et cetera, white pine. So, pick your uh, <clears throat> poison there. Well, I'll I'll reflect a little bit on this workshop as as we promised uh, we would do for this. You know, I'm a forest social scientist or a human dimensions of natural resources specialist. So I tend to think about how people relate to forests, whereas Bob, as the civiculture person, is focused on how the trees grow, how you can manage the trees. And that's uh, that partially is what makes it so fun for Bob and I to manage tree farms together. So I attended the workshop and you know, climate change can be really over overwhelming and it can be a bit depressing at times, but I walked away from the workshop feeling very encouraged. There are a lot of foresters in the region who are attending programs like this and trying to learn how to manage the, the forest in a changing climate. And so, you know, the embrace of continued learning among these people who are working professionals was was great. And that gives me hope that Maine Woodland owner members are going to, as more and more foresters, get up to speed on on what the latest science is suggesting for creating resilient forests. We're, you're going to have resources and, and access there. So I kind of got the sense this is doable. You know, the future is uncertain, but the principles of ecological complexity and maintaining options and all of that, foresters do have a skill set, existing skill set. You just have, it's going to be a little bit different thinking about, like Bob mentioned, having carbon as a, as a consideration will, uh, we, we then can deploy the tools and the fundamental understandings of uh, biology to make that, to make that work. Another observation I had is that all of these choices that we face about stewarding our forests are rooted in trade-offs. And so, you know, you might have recreation, wildlife, privacy, timber, contributing to climate solutions, all of that. Um, we broke in, when we were in the field, we would break into small groups and decide how we were, what we would do. And inevitably we got into the, to that there were multiple options for how we might manage this example forest that we were in, but it always involved trade-offs and trying to, you know, I think foresters are really good about thinking long-term and also balancing multiple trade-offs. So uh, the, the sense of trade-offs was just a key thing for me. And then there was a talk by a UNH Cooperative Extension uh, Forest Specialist on some of the programs, carbon market programs that are available for small woodland owners. And the thing that really piqued my interest there was, was the, the issue of contracts. 
and our contract literacy and our ability to read these contracts that we may get presented with, as, as Bob and I have done a little mystery shopper of some of these different carbon programs, we have not entered into a carbon market program. Uh, we have read some of those contracts and they're tricky. And I intend to, if we, before we signed anything, I would want to have a suite of professionals. I have a doctor, a dentist, uh, you know, for landowners, a forester should be on that suite of professionals and an attorney. And I think it's, uh, you know, these carbon market contracts are some, some challenging. So th that was sort of the, sort of the gist that I got from, from the, from the workshop. Good. Okay. Well, I think, um, I think then Jen, you, you were gonna, uh, some people sent some, uh, so we want it normally in fireside forestry, we jump right into questions that people, uh, provide in the, from the audience. And then we just answer them and it's completely random. We wanted to do something a little different because we had this workshop experience and we wanted to share some reflections on that to kick it off. But then Jen, we'll, we'll transition back to the typical format. And if anybody submitted questions ahead of time, we'd love to dive into those. So I did, I did get one kind of comment question um, before this session started, um, which I will, um, I will present, but I do see someone having a, they have a question regarding the workshop that you just discussed from Jake. Bob, does recovering the carbon storage as quick as possible going against building forest structure with healthy under, middle, and overstory? That's a great question. I think, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it, it it's, I suppose it's, you could, uh, the, you know, the best carbon storage program at the stand level is no harvest at all. So, you know, and that, of course, that is not scalable because we can't just stop, excuse me, harvesting trees. So my message was lighter harvest with shorter recovery times um, is probably a pretty uh, strong uh, carbon uh, strategy as long as you, by, you know, I'm saying a light harvest, no more than 30 to 40% of removal of what's there currently. It, because if you go heavier, the, the, the trees are very isolated and they don't recover their leaf area really. And they, then as Jake suggests, the, alloc, the light comes through and allocates uh, resources to the mid story and understory, which is a good thing to do. Um, in the long run, we have to re, forests need regeneration, right? And I think, <clears throat> specific so i think the, the the answer to jake's question is somewhat specific to the forest type i think if you're trying to maintain an oak pine forest for example those species are intermediate and shade tolerance they need some light um keeping a very dense overstory very light cutting will probably transition that to other species in the long run not the, those species won't regenerate so you would need to make openings slightly more open However, if you're managing most of our shade tolerant species, um, then I think you probably the one third removal is kind of a sweet spot in most cases. And this, this is, of course, if you have a forest or a stand that uh, consists of long life species. The example in the talk I gave where we were, you know, arguably cut it a little more heavily was a case where there was a lot of fir and a lot of dying white birch. And, you know, that would have died and gone away anyway and regenerated. So there was no point in not cutting that. It's just that in the course of doing that, we also marked a lot of poor quality red maple and thin cedar and this and that. And we, that when you added the, the dying trees to the thinning, uh, the stand ended up really quite open and very patchy and probably just an excellent uh, condition for wildlife. I mean, there are birds there that were not there before. I mean, a lot of it was really good. As just said, this is all about trade-offs. There's no magic prescription where you can, you know, do the right thing for all objectives, right? Um, and my, so whenever you, I have this mantra, right? There are three reasons to leave a tree in a silvicultural prescription. There's the regeneration reason, seed and shade. There's the leaving it because it's immature as growing stock. And then more the more convent, new uh, objective is biodiversity, leaving it for, you know, wildlife and legacy and all of that, big, uh, large cavity trees. 
uh, just biological legacies. Well, there's now a fourth reason, and that's avoiding carbon emissions. Because because every tree you cut, only maybe if you're lucky, one third of that will go into some kind of permanent storage temporarily. In the long run, maybe it's 20%. So two thirds of that tree that you cut becomes emissions back in the atmosphere. And, you know, I'm not saying avoid that. I'm just saying make that count with a really excellent uh, silvicultural prescription that's as light as possible. Because that, that if you do that, take the same amount of wood and allocate it to a bunch of stands that are cut lightly, you will affect more area positively, right, than cutting heavily and getting sort of bogged down in fewer acres. That's a longstanding principle of forest management. So make it count, right? And and if you get that reco quick recovery in the leaf area, then the carbon footprint will, you can get the same wood with, I think, a lower footprint overall if you aggregated this over the landscape. So I don't know. That's a, I guess, a, a maybe too long an answer to Jake's question. So it depends, right? It's like everything. <laughs> so he also asks in long term when the trees uh, are not competing and stagnating, is that also for long term? Um, I think as long as they're not dying, right? It's if they're dying, like fir does and birch and short life species, then then harvest them, right? And if that's the dominant stand component, you really have no choice because nature's going to harvest them. We have, and then there are pests. I, one of the three cases I cover deals with the emerald ash borer, which is not there in Sebec yet and hopefully won't be there for a while, but the stand is 80%, 90% ash. What do you do? And I simulated the consequences. It's a long story and it's pretty interesting. So um, the message really is to try to, given that we're facing all these climate and uh, issues, the uncertain climate, an uncertain pest future, I think the whole idea of, of diversifying your portfolio, just like you would in, this, uh, in your mutual funds, all clearly applies to your forest. Try to have a diversity of species so that you will uh, weather any, uh, any single event that might have just uh, influence just a single species, a pest for is be the best example. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, Chip Bessie sent a quick question, um, but there's a, there's some shortcut language here. So, yeah, I'll read it. Oh. But uh, if you can, um, I can, I can, I can, yeah. I can paraphrase it. Yep, that'd uh, be great. Yeah, that's probably I. What we did in the video, actually, I recorded. If you watch the video, you'll see a three-minute snippet of where we went into the field and recorded the details. I'll try to uh, I'll try to repeat this one here. It was a stand that was dominated by fir and cedar and red maple. Um, of course, this is on Wikipedia Woods had a long history of tending, um, but Ron Locke had grown this cohort of balsam fir that was dying from a delgid, and the white birch was 120 years old, very valuable and dying. So we wanted needed to capture that. In the course of doing that, those some of that was patchy, so that the, the there there ended up being gaps that are that we planted to pine just because there were no advanced regeneration there, even a fir. Um, and, uh, and then the 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 extra uh, wood, what I now overcut from a carbon footprint standpoint, would have been. Uh, what we call UGS, unacceptable growing stock, red maple, things, you know, that don't, will never make a saw log. My, it's always been sort of my approach to, if you have a good, you know, pulpwood market or firewood market, and you're in there and you got an eight inch crooked red maple, you might as well take it, right? But, and that, you know, if that was all there was, then that would have been a perfectly fine prescription. But in addition, by doing that, that added enough, that made a 35% removal of the fir and the paper birch, by the time we cut all the UG growing stock of hardwood and cedar, it's now a 55, another 20% came out, right? So we ended up with a 55% removal. Now, financially, I'm sure we did the right thing um, because that, you know, those trees do not earn you anything. So I'm sure that's fine financially. And then I calculated actually the, the carbon in those extra trees, if you will, that we could have left standing to have a lower carbon footprint. Um, we would have what they were worth to us on the market as forest products. We the carbon vendors would have had to pay us twenty seven dollars a ton, or for the carbon in those trees, such that we would have been indifferent about leaving them. And of course, the price of carbon is what ten or twelve dollars. So again, we made this financially smart decision, 
Um, however, the other side of that is, is like those trees would probably be alive in the next entry, right? We could cut them 15 years from now. And when, as the stand regenerates and recovers in those areas that, where the fir was cut in the gap. So uh, from a carbon standpoint, that would have been a better option and certainly something we could have afforded to do. And had I really thought about it and modeled it, uh, that probably is what we'd have done. And, but that was, this is only 2017, six years ago. Thinking is really advanced, you know, uh, about carbon and the science of it. At least I try to keep up with it and write about it so that the, our readers can share this uh, knowledge as fast as I gain it, at least. And I think it's a moving target. We're not certainly not done. The markets keep changing. Um, and but the age old, you know, the silvics of the tree species, you know, the mills that buy this wood aren't that different than they were six years ago. So uh, and uh, so it's it's a challenge. OK, there's the video, you know, you know. Yep. Yeah, and I see uh, Patricia's made a comment. I've heard that slow growing old growth is more carbon rich than new growth. Is the age of the tree one of the criteria for cutting? I think this is a great opportunity, Bob, to just yeah. describe a tree and what yeah. part is carbon and and a little, you know, we use carbon, but it's it's a physical thing. Why not? That, why there's not no question that old, old forest, old growth forests have the highest stocking of carbon. OK, so that part is true. However, <clears throat> they grow slowly, if at all, once they reach some you know, very high level, large trees. Uh, so the, the rate, so that's carbon storage. That, and then there's the, what we call sequestration, which is a fancy word for growth or accumulation of carbon, annual, the annual growth of accumulation of carbon. That's highest in young forests. So we can't necessarily have it both ways. Um, as I said in the talk at the end, I think storage, if we're in a, a short term, you know, like I say, medium term, 22 or three decade framework here where we really do have to make big reductions in emissions, uh, the, the, the near present is very important. And I think storage trumps sequestration. So if you have high carbon stocking in a forest, if you harvest those trees, as I just said, you know, 30, 70 percent of it's going to go into emissions. And it'll be 40 or 50 years before that whatever grows back is sequestering carbon anywhere near what was there that you took. So that's always short in the short term. Harvesting is always a negative, even including storage and forest products, um, be, just because the, the, the manufacturing process is, is, is just creates lots of emissions. The slash is left in the woods that decays. The sawmills, I mean, uh, the net yield of, of a board out of a tree is what, maybe third or 40% of what the roundwood content is. The rest goes into chips or gets burned in the biomass boiler. All of that, all of that goes back into the atmosphere. So it's much better to, as long as those trees are not going to die, it's better to keep them standing and alive, right? Um, to, to keep that carbon storage because you're not going to grow it back uh, uh, in that same stand for decades, right? But now, at, on a landscape level, this is more complicated because you, you need, in a managed forest, you need to have uh, trees of all ages, right? Otherwise, it ultimately won't be sustainable because any, because you presumably are harvesting somewhere, something somewhere, that needs to be replaced with vigorous regeneration. Ideally, from well-stocked advanced regeneration that's already in the understory. Uh, that's another important principle, this fact that you, we can grow trees that overlap. And I think Jake's uh, suggestion there that having a healthy, thriving mid-story and understory is important because then when you remove those large trees, something is beneath it that will immediately capture that growing space and you don't go through this long period. The issue of Maine woodlands that just came out, some of you may have already gotten, I haven't seen it yet, but in print, talks about that in the, with respect to managing beach, these big open patch clear cuttings that take forever to regenerate and they don't regenerate to what you cut are just bad news, right? They're bad news for the old fashioned reasons, but they're really bad news from a silver, from a carbon standpoint because they take a long time for that leaf area to recover versus you know, a well-stocked layer of advanced regeneration that's already there, which you can create by these prior light partial cuttings, shelter wood cuttings, selection cuttings, right? So that, that's this, this an alley Kasiba shows all the, in the first part of the talk, all the reasons why that's true biologically. And we've sort of known that for a long time. It's just now, there's just another reason to manage that way, so. 
<clears throat> uh, maybe, um, so I guess when you're talking about old trees, while it, that's not, um, not all old trees are big trees, it's the oh. big trees are the ones that are storing carbon in, in a, True. in a tree, how much of a tree is carbon? 50% actually <laughs> of the dry weight. So, and that's, that's a remarkable statistic. All tissues in the tree are about half carbon. It's actually not exactly that. It's like 49.2 if you yeah, show up. Yeah, right? give us the biology um, lesson. Cause I just think that's interesting. Uh, that well, so you half can look of it, at a tree of, and it's- about, yeah. about, So if, if you took a green tree weighted, half of that's gonna be water, right? So carbon, carbon being an atom, right? Uh, we, uh, you then would take the water out of the tree, put it in the kiln, right? Harvest it, dry it, all that, um, and all that tissue that remains is fifty percent carbon, roughly. The bark, the wood, the the leaves, if you have them, are all that. So, so roughly a quarter of the green weight of a tree is carbon, right? Um, is is what it would work out, and we can. We can estimate it pretty quickly from basal area. I have we haven't been doing this. Uh, there's an old we've long used like the basal area of a tree uh, to estimate the volumes of those trees, the conventional cord or board foot volumes. We, they're called V bars, volume to basal area ratios. I in the in the course of doing these talks and these case studies, I also using the FBS model, I calculated the carbon. You can then because carbon is because just half of the volume, right? It's easy to then come up with what I call C bars carbon to basal area ratios, which are almost identical to cords, actually. It turns out that uh, roughly in that in the case that Chip is asking about, the one that we maybe allegedly overcut a little bit, it's roughly four to one, right? There's like uh, four, well, one fourth of, uh, uh, so uh, divide the basal area by four, all right? So if you have 100 square feet of basal area in a stand, you have 25 tons of carbon standing there, oven dry. Right. Well, carbon is just a molecule, you know, a, an atom, right? So it's by definition dry. Then you get into the CO2. Like some people, the some of the early compliance carbon markets then convert that back to CO2 equivalents, right? Which is the CO2 molecule, which is what 44 twelfths, the you know, two oxygen atoms uh, divided by the carbon, uh, well, which is 12, the atomic wave, all of that. Then you get into these co more complicated, non-intuitive things. I just like to think in just terms of the simple carbon, and it's much simpler. That's what you get paid for actually in the market. Now, most of the the voluntary markets are just simply carbon if it's if they're paying for it at all. Yeah. Uh, who else? Okay. Is there any um, new in the chat so box? Here? We can, um, the, the one question was also that I, or one comment I received before this session was from Patricia as well, just that um, she's take, she's acquired some more forest land and she wanted to know where to start with her, I, I call it her forest management journey or forest ownership journey. So I love uh, this one. Maybe I, 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 ask this, I ask a lot of foresters, you know, what do you tell new owners? What's yeah. the first thing you want? Which, what's the first thing you think they should do? when you first acquire some woods? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll jump in first, then Bob can jump in. I think there's also, there's sort of an official answer. And and um, so I'll I'll give the official, an I, I feel like we're all well-trained. So the what we're supposed to say is consult with your main forest service district forester. They're free. They'll come and do a walk and talk with you. They'll get you going. They have access to the Trees of Maine book and they're a great, impartial uh uh starting place to listen and and look at where you are and what your woods is like and um just a, a great entry point and that is true however i think more important is exploring and getting comfortable with your land navigating uh making making sure that you're able to get out there without um you know the risk to minimizing the risks of getting lost. And there's a variety of ways to do that, whether it's a, a app on your phone, an analog compass, um, studying Google Earth, and then um, other little tricks. Like um, I use sound a lot to be oriented uh, to road noise and various uh, distance things. Sometimes um, 
air, air flyover patterns and stuff like that. But I think those observations that you make in that just exploring, like you don't have to have a forester right away. You don't have to have a forest management plan right away. Figuring out where your special places are and what recreation use you might have, where your boundary lines are. Those are like some of the really great very first steps, I think, for people people to take. We did a beginning landowner study here at the University of Maine. Uh, my grad student, Ian Anderson, who's now a forester and, and small-scale uh, logging professional in North Carolina, uh, originally from Eastern Tennessee, he did this study. And uh, that was, we could almost stack up as we asked people, like, what activities have you done? of these people that owned their property for less than five years. And the, the exploring their property definitely was that entry activity. And then some um, building of trails and gathering of firewood, even if it was just downed uh, branches for a fire pit, like a little bonfire or something like that was, was definitely like, as we put them in descending order of frequency, there, there were these initial activities that were far more common than jumping jumping into seeking a professional and getting a, a formal management plan. What would you say, Bob? Well, it depends on where you're starting from and your knowledge. I would the first thing I would I would learn to identify my tree species in all seasons. I think that's a great, you know, fundamental skill of owning a woodlot. And that's not necessarily easy in Maine if you're starting. Uh, without much background, right? Um, but The Trees of Maine is an excellent book, and there's lots out there. Um, and I think we we always offer Maine woodland owners and other under venues like it's at the Common Ground Fair, right? Tree ID. Learn that you learn your trees. I think, um, in addition to what Jess said, I think, uh, and this this may just be me, but I think a lot of people are fascinated by history. I wrote a couple years ago about how you can trace the history of your property maybe clear back to the original deeds uh, and, and learn in the 1870s, if it's old farmland, who was farming it and what they were growing there, right? That just could, if there's own stone walls on this, on this land. Um, so uh, there's that. So that, you know, how did the, what, what for a kind of forest do you have? I mean, there's, I mean, that's a natural curiosity. And then I immediately, and I was trained and I always try to train students to think backwards and how did this forest get this way, right? That was sort of like the first premise. If you're gonna manage something and then, you know, cut some trees um, to influence, that's the essence of silviculture in many ways, um, you know, understand how the forest got there in the first place and what, you know, what is very likely harvested in the past, right? Some way, maybe not in a good way, right? It may have been exploited and, you know, lessons can always be learned from that, what not to do again. So yeah, that's only if you're considering doing something. If the forest is just young and you know, and you it's a relatively small area. If you have over 10 acres, you can uh, apply to be in the tree growth program. Uh, if you if you that would assume that you are going to do some forest management at some point, right? There are other, you know, just to ease the tax burden that you might have, depending on what town you're in. Um, and or you could go into open space. So those those tax questions are important if you if your taxes are, you know, a, a burden to you, right? Uh, you can always ameliorate that with these programs. I forgot about the the other major obvious thing, which uh, you've already started, Patricia. Which is I always tell people to join Maine Woodland Owners, and then once you do that, in addition to reading your monthly newsletter, is participating in events because that's a great yeah. chance to Show go look up. at other woods and just absorb okay. stuff. And the annual meeting is coming up in January, so that's now like it's December, so it's next month. And that is one of my favorite things because it's at the Ag Trades show. So there's also the really fun exhibit hall to walk through. And then there's a day long information and education and a launch. And I, I, I saw in the December newsletter, there's going to be a chestnut video that uh, we'll get to watch and a forest health update. And it's also nice. I think just I think attendance is generally around 150 people, uh, 150 main woodland owners members. So there's just you'll you'll see that you're you fit in and you're like everybody like everybody else you just really like your woods 
I would say also we try to, with what you just said, Jessica, we try to make it clear that you're not alone. You know, it, it can be, it can feel lonely. You own woods, you don't see your, you can't see neighbors, you know, you're, ice, you're kind of in a solitary condition with, with woods, but there's a really robust small woodland owner community. I mean, I, obviously I'm aware of it because I, I'm in an office where small woodland owners are calling every day or emailing. And so I'm aware of that. And so my job is to make sure that everybody who's connected to us understands that as well. And so these types of programs are a way for us to to know each that we're out there and um and to and there are no I'm also learning there are no dumb questions about <clears throat> what you should be doing with your woods. Um mm -hmm. the I mean getting in your woods is what we like to say is the first literally the first step. <laughs> um and even if you go in with some tape, you know, and just pick your pick a, a trail a little bit of a trail and put some um and put some flagging on trees as you're going kind of like the Hansel and Gretel uh, model you know so you know how to get yourself back out you know that's actually a lot of people have some concern about getting in and not knowing if they can get out <laughs> um so creating your own trails finding a special um something you observe something that's special maybe it was a, a a tree that just kind of sticks out for you and make that a point of uh, reference when you're in your woods. It pretty much is an is a, a blank canvas that you can create whatever you need. But we also are encouraging people to um, set some goals. Like in 10 years, I hope that I have this happen in my woods or that I can do this or I'm more aware of of that or I want to make some money. I mean, that's not a problem either. Um, and so um, we're here to help with any of those types of um, aspirations, but uh, thinking about it, you know, in a, in a long-term sense, this is a long game um, is the other thing I have come to understand over these years. And so thinking long-term is really essential, whether it's what species you want to promote or, you know, thinking about the effects of climate change or just in, in your family, how, how do you want your, what, what do you want to leave for your family? It's a bit of a legacy as well. So big lofty thoughts. We've been Patricia, taking photos. Do you, want to jump in? You, you three are really quite a resource. Thank you so very much. Um, I've learned a lot just listening to the three of you so far. And I am really a newbie. So this is fun. Good, good. <laughs> Bob and I, well, Bob's owned a woodlot longer than me, but I became a woodland owner in 2012. And so I'm, in the scheme of things, I'm also a, very much a new landowner. And it's just recently that, boy, the value of having taken photos, all of our photos have been taken just from our phone, right? And, but in a decade, the forest does change, but you don't notice it unless you have unless you freeze it in time with a photo. So I think that's fun. So maybe I'm actually like an intermediate um, uh, landowner in terms of um, being 11 years into having owned land, but it is amazing how it slowly changes over time and it's easy to miss the changes. But um, th so that'd be another thing is if if it's new new to you, then maybe a day of photos would be really cool and then and then go check on it in 10 years. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Chip I asked a question. If yeah, I just I also take... put the link to our new Woodland owner okay. uh, page, which Patricia I already sent you on email. But for anybody else who's curious about, you know, what are the what what does a new woodland owner what should be on your mind? Um, or what kinds of things do you want to consider? We have a page that kind of collects all these these ideas. So yeah, and what I'll are go... some of the questions? I, know I appreciated right your response. I appreciated your response, Jen, and I will look at all of those sites. Thank you so much. Okay. I'll go find the Tom Wessels link. I see that uh, Jake recommended the Tom Wessels video and during the pandemic. So Tom Wessels wrote the book, Reading the Landscape, uh, Reading the Forested Landscape, perhaps something like that. He I, also I have wrote a, it. Okay, great. And he also I wrote it, yeah. Forensics. And yes, I have that one too. 
awesome. He's just outstanding, just entertaining. Yeah. He's the best there is. Yeah, I, I went for a walk with him at, at Woodlawn, oh. and uh, oh, oh, good, he was jealous. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I great. I could That's do that. great. Yeah, he <laughs> just gets you excited, video. right? Yeah, about the history. He just knows so much. Yeah, great. Yeah. You're welcome. He was my uh, graduate school professor, actually, which was really really. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wessels, really? Mm -hmm. oh You've been god. keeping that a secret, Jen. Oh my god, that's a yeah. You're lucky. Yeah. So he um he signed a bunch of books, and we gave them out as a thank you to our annual appeal for our annual appeal last year. We do have a few copies here in the office, so uh -huh. anybody's looking for one. And I also want to put a shameless plug for this year's annual appeal. We are giving out for anybody who gives um, two fifty or more, they get a copy of the uh, main um, forest uh, forest trees guide. So we have a mm -hmm. bunch of those to give away. So love to have support. I see Ross. Do you have a yeah. question, Mister? Well, Clark? I see you have fifteen minutes left, so I'll lay a question on you, Bob. Go ahead. I have a hundred year old oak red maple stand with a dense understory, you know, of uh, hornbeam, hop hornbeam, witch hazel, red maple stems, several thousand stems per acre. I applied for and was granted an NRCS cost share program to remove the witch hazel, hornbeam, and hop hornbeam. But no yeah. mention was made of the red maple. There's several hundred stems of red maple per acre. These are all stump sprouts from previous thinnings. I'm wondering what I should do with them. You know, on one hand, they're yeah. dense shade, and on the other hand, they're advanced regeneration. So what what right. what do I do going forward here? With specifically, you're asking about the red maple sprouts, right? Um, and should I cut it or leave it? Yeah. Uh, does the stand are the red mature red maples good quality and valuable? Is, is it a kind of a site that would grow good red maple? That's the first uh, question. Iffy. Yeah, there are a few good ones, but there's a lot of junkers. It's a mid-quality site. Um, if the if they're they could be junk just because the stand was high graded, maybe before you owned it, uh, Oakley, or maybe it's just the site. If the if the oak is good, it's oak, right? How much is oak and how much is maple? Of it's the, about so half and half. Half and half. So you'd rather have oak. That's going to be hard with the deer. Um, and the maple, even though they'll even eat off the maple. I recommend because of the difficulty in regenerate, just in general, hardwood regeneration, we've been, I used to, you know, we discriminating against red maple was used to be really easy because there were lots of options. There were fewer deer, right? You'd have white ash come in and all this. And now ash is, of course, problematic. Um, so we've been thinning, I, I, and I, I, we just, I was just out on my research, the AFERP experiment yesterday. And we, in that regeneration, those gaps, we thinned a lot of those stump sprouts to a single stem and they just look fabulous. They're just growing really well because you get to pick the real winner, right? The nice straight one, the low origin sprout. I wouldn't necessarily, I would have maybe 50 of them per acre, not a lot, but I would keep, I would keep some of them just as insurance against the deer, especially if you're going to treat all of that hornbeam and the, and the hazel brush. Um, yeah, that's an interesting one, isn't it? With the hornbeam being, it is a, it's shade tone and it, it does, and we don't, you find examples of it here, but it usually is not interfering nearly as badly as say beach would be, right? But that's, it's going to have the same effect, a dense, low shade cover of, you know, that will just prevent regeneration of anything more valuable, even if you did like, if you did imagine doing a shelterwood cutting or something, right? That's going to just, it's just going to respond, but it's never going to grow into valuable growing stock, right? So um, that's good that you can get that funding to do that. That probably sounds sounds expensive and and, and time consuming, but it, how are you going to keep? You probably have to treat those stumps to keep because the hornbeam is going to sprout too, aren't you? I mean, you're going to have to. Otherwise, you're just going to make more of a mess. Well, I'm I'm following your beach method as I'm cutting yeah. them off waist high and then spraying them with glycerin. Yeah. yeah, that'll do it. That's what you want to do, right? Good work. Yeah, and thin your maple to a single stem, but not necessarily every one, depending on how many you have. Every maybe a 30 foot space, 20, 30 foot spacing on those. Any denser, just cut them and kill them, right? And then uh, with the idea you're going to have a, maybe 150 to 100 per acre in the next crop, that will be, and they'll be selected maples. They, they, should, they should grow fine. Stump, there's an old myth. This is a myth, by the way, that stump sprouts are bad. 
growing stock. That comes from a long, from many centuries of coppicing, or in other words, uh, sprouting, generating. In the Middle Ages in Europe, they would create these coppice fuel wood forests, right? That went on for uh, centuries. They would cut them on a 30 year rotation because all they had was big broad axes to cut the tree. So they'd let them get up to be about five inches, whack them off with this big ax when they're 30 years old. And of course, being mostly oaks, they would sprout vigorously. And this just went on for centuries, right? Like probably 10 rotations of this coppice management. And after that, repeated that long a time, the root systems eventually became decadent and it was hard to then pick saw log trees. So they, the, the European forest, this is when forestry, of course, was first starting as a science. And Europe, by the 1800s, they realized they're gonna have to start regenerating these from seed, from new, you know, letting some of the coppice grow older so it would be sexually mature and produce acorns, right? And then, and that's what they did, right? Being Europeans, they were patient enough to do that and they regenerated those forests to higher quality trees. But what we have in North America, just one or two generations of this, this is actually common in the 1800s, New England, there's coppice two or three generations of, guess what? American chestnut was coppice for that same purpose. Of course, we don't do that anymore. A lot of the oak and red maple forests that we have out there that are now 80 or 100, are most, a lot of those are coppice origin forests from one time fuel wood cutting, right? Those sprouts are perfectly vigorous. Those root systems are fine. And because of the compartmentalization phenomenon that I've written about, whereby the tree essentially walls off infection, right? Uh, remember, trees don't heal, they compartmentalize. They, you know, they infected, they just wall off the infection. They don't necessarily kill it, but they keep it from spreading by that barrier zone. And, and red maple's particularly good at that. So that's why you can take a red maple sprout clump, even though the, all the other sprouts just rot off and the stump is rotten, that, that is now attached to a vigorous root system that's usurped from the parent tree, and it's going to be just fine, not, not have any decay from that. So don't fear that part about it. If you pick your pick the lowest origin sprout, and of course you want one that's of course straight and not crooked, right? And then cut all the others. You can actually just cut them off high. Do not treat these with herbicide or you'll get backlash and kill your crop tree. That's one case. So it's gonna re-sprout. You got a, you say a two inch red maple stump sprout, right? A bunch of them, right? Cut all but one and those other ones will sprout again, but they will just be, the deer will just chew them off or something. And that, that one sprout will be so vigorous, it'll just blow up into the canopy. So that works, right? That even though it looked kind of messy because of that re-sprouting, that's not a factor. You don't have to worry about that. So that's what I would do. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we want to take up Chip's question here about this beech thickets? Go for um, it. I hate these questions, Chip. You know you <laughs> ask me these hard ones where there's no good answer, right? Um, and you're exactly right. You've hit on the, uh, the 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 dilemma because beech is carbon dense, right? It's a very dense hardwood, so it be carbon being proportional to the weight, the dry weight of the tree. Beech has a lot. These things uh, have probably a lot of carbon stored there. Um, uh, you know, so uh, if if you just, as I've been writing, just heavy cutting of those things without any plan to replace them with anything is bad news. You're just going to get beach back. If you spray the stumps and kill the beach, you're then you, then what are you going to get, right? You're going to have to plant something if you want something good. And if it's pure beach, you know, and there's no seed sources of oak or other species, maple, that you might grow there, that's a very difficult problem. I would have to actually see the stand to really make a prescription for that. I think I would just, um, depending on how uh, diseased it is, I mean, uh, and how old it is, I would thin the beach. That, that seems unconventional, but that's what Peter Pfeiffer was doing when we went to his lot. You were there, I believe. It, so it's relatively healthy beach. Um, just thin it, right? Especially if it's like, you know, pulpwood size, firewood size, thin it. If it's big old growth beach, then that's another issue. There's not a lot of that left. You know, those trees have either died or are resistant. So um, so consider thinning of beach is what I would do. And maybe that would buy you some time uh, to get other seed sources. Uh, so advanced regeneration of maybe white pine or who knows what's going to come out underneath it. If you start doing thinning, just letting it sit there is probably not a great option. If it's like if it's all unmerchantable, if you're talking about thickets that are all three inches, then you'd of course have to spend money to a lot of money probably to, to thin that, whether that would pay, I, I doubt it. 
and then you'd get resuckering, you know, because you'd be cutting a lot of trees, you'd leaving beach, it'd be hard to spray the stumps without killing the residuals. That, that's a tough one. But from a carbon standpoint, you know, light thinning or no management, as long as it's not dying, is going to be the best uh, footprint. That isn't necessarily the best option as a landowner, and you, like in your case, where you want to grow forest products as well. So tough one. Best, the best thing is not <clears throat> try to avoid these situations from developing in the first place. And I, you know, I'm sure you probably didn't create this, your management, you probably inherited it, but there's plenty of that out there. And I'm just, can, can, I'm going to, I'm going to write a whole, I'm not done writing about beach. I've got at least three more articles and uh, there's going to be, I'm going to take up this case and I'll think in more detail about it and write about these options. There's really a lot of great information out there about managing beach. Most of it comes from New York. And, uh, you know, we're just a little too parochial here and are not even aware of some of this stuff. It's coming out of Cornell and Ralph Nyland's work. Um, and so I'm going to I'm going to fix that if you read my columns over the next few months. Bob, that, speaking of Cornell, that reminds me of the um, upcoming meeting I'm hosting here in Maine. And I could uh, uh, while I talk, you could uh, close your blind because you're having to put your head off of the screen to get out of that yeah, sunlight. Yeah. I know that's yeah. coming out from the upper window where there's no blind. I already have done uh, what I can to deal oh, with it. Oh, but it looks like you got it figured out right now. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to tell everybody that we're hosting the Northeastern Forest Extension or Forest Resources Extension Council meeting next week in Maine. And we have people from eight different states coming who work in forestry extension. And that will include these leaders in beach management from Cornell um, where they also have slash walls as a deer deterrent, as a um, sort of fencing, um, using after harvest, having the feller buncher stack um, slash, and they're doing some other really interesting stuff with artificial intelligence and sort of um, on the ground mapping of forests and things like that. So I'm expecting a lot of information exchange. We're going to share what the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Maine Woods group is up to that's uh, our contribution to the meeting so it's going to be going to be really great and you can read about the co UMaine cooperative extension group in the December Maine Woodlands newsletter Dean Carter has written the um, president's or the I'm not sure what it's called but the that initial column and and talks about the um, increased focus on forestry extension within the University of Maine and I see J Jake has a question here about the high stumps, yeah. Um, Go ahead and um, can you read the question? Because I realize for the recording, people don't see this. Yeah, question. Jake has asked, have you heard about cutting beach stumps high to prevent sprouting? And Jen, you wrote a little blurb about this right before the, the tree farm day, right? Roger Green has done this in the wildlands in Orland. I'm skeptical about it. And I, I'm kind of with you. It, it, it works in some cases and it doesn't work in other cases. Nyland has actually studied this and I will write about it. I'll review his work. In, in, in Ralph's case in New York, it's worked, it's like, just like I just said, I guess, in some cases, it has been somewhat effective. Roger, I think, claims about, what, just 70, we were just there. We came, we went back and spent a whole day with Roger and Landon looking at these issues and, you know, learned a lot, actually. And I think uh, what, what, again, is what we saw the, exactly the same thing. We saw variable outcomes, right? If the trees are young and fairly vigorous, it's not going to work at all. They're just going to form stool sprouts right when you cut them off. If they're in a shaded understory, and Roger's very sensitive about this, then I think in many cases it works. Uh, the Cornell people also talk about low stumping, not high stumping. So there, there's two approaches to this. And um, I guess if the high stumping works, it's... Uh, it's only because the sprouts, because they come off of the, you know, some that's three feet off the ground are not competitive. But cutting off, uh, I'm going to write, the, the column I'm about to write is a, is a case, uh, one of the case studies I'm going to review was, a, was a, uh, a bunch of one acre patch cuts done by the Maine Bureau of Parks and Lands in Riley, where they had the feller buncher cut off the beach saplings high. And that, that just led to a disaster. That is all beach now. Not all, but I mean, the it did not get rid of the beach. It was cut in the winter. Timing, of course, is obviously important. Um, <clears throat> um, cutting them in the winter is not the time to do it. If you did it in August, it might have a higher probability, right? Just because that's physiologically the time when the reserves in the root system are lowest. So I would not, if you want to get rid of beach, you really, I, I hate to say this because I know some people don't like using herbicides, but 
the you need to treat those stumps and they will be gone and you will you know you will have beach seedlings but those new beach seedlings aren't necessarily bad especially if you leaving resistant beech trees in your prescriptions they is the other case study i'm going to write about is a long-term study by dave houston who's the high priest of beech bark disease it's now 33 years old it was done in 1990 where they did clear cuts partial cuts controls uh, George Ritz and Bill Mahan and I went and looked at that about a month ago now. And it's there's a video of that also on my YouTube channel. You can see what we saw, and I'm going to write more about it. I've been in touch with Dave and others that, about that study. So there's a lot of interesting lessons there. Um, about I, I think it's, it's a great, as a social scientist, it's really interesting because the published work mostly appears to be case studies. And there's right, a lot of room right. for the four scientists to... Um, it would be fabulous to see them design a really rigorous, really well replicated sort of study to resolve this. But foresters pay attention. And so you hear that that it works in some cases. And I just think it's fascinating because that's probably true. But in what what is the instance or what is the biological reason for it working or not working? And Bob started to rattle off some of those variables like timing and height and all of that, but there's just a lot of variables that it could be. And then, um, but foresters make observations and that's a great place to start and then back out into something that, um, you know, fits sort of the scientific rigor of a experiment. Rennie Germain, who's the on the faculty at Syracuse, CSF, gave a nice talk at the last year's New England SAF meeting. And I got, this was about a large term case study, hardwood shelterwood cutting, where it, he, he estimated in detail the cost of using a mechanized harvester, a fellow buncher, to cut off all the beech stems in the understory. It's actually published in Forest Science, and he sent me the manuscript. And I'm going to, I'll include that too, probably two issues from now when we get into the actual treatments. And it was over $100. So this is like something that's been fairly common to larger landowners who use this method to pay that uh, harvester operator more money just to whack those stems off. And they <clears throat> typically do it high, right? They cut the stump side thinking that that's going to be a good thing. Um, now, I, I chastise him because it's like, you spend a hundred dollars just to cut them off. And then he, a lot of his talk is about how all the beach regenerate. Now we get the problem all back again. I said, why don't you spray those stumps? And plus you can do, you can cut them off for less than a hundred dollars with motor manual methods. That's a lot of money to spend doing this. I don't know. Ross is probably getting more money than that to cut his horn bean from the NRCS because they have generous uh, values. Roger pays his crews down in Orland much more than that to do this same work, a lot more. Um, there is obviously so much that we could keep talking about. I think probably yeah, this means we need time. to do another right. fireside forestry, but Jen, why don't you wrap us up? We could do a beach program for sure. Um, uh, there is, Jake had a follow-up question. Do you know how to be in touch with each other uh, to follow up with, uh, he said, it, uh, if you leave a lot of overstory, what about re regeneration of other species? Yeah, well, that depends on the species as I'm writing. I mean, that's what, uh, as I started these columns on beach, it's like, let's think about the details of sugar maple. Let's think, and I haven't, and that's the only one I've written about. Let's talk about oak. Let's talk about yellow birch. Let's talk about those. So though, yeah, it, it obviously, you have to have a seed source. That's true, but that's, it takes more than that. So. And I just put Bob's uh, email in the chat for anyone yeah. who has follow-ups. Yeah, I, Jake, I'm sure knows how to get a hold of me. I know how to get and a every, hold of After every yeah. column in our newsletter is uh, Bob's uh, YouTube channel right. and his email. And at times, Jessica's information if she's co-writing. Absolutely, yeah. Co thanks, I, thanks, Chip, for the comment. I really appreciate that. This is great. Re, reaffirms well, why we do this. What yeah, so this we'll is, do so this again. Um, yes. we, we've done this. We we do it two or three times in the winter. So we'll, we'll yeah. probably look to February to do this again. So thank you everyone for being here. Appreciate thank it. You. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for, yeah, for joining us. That's great. Have we'll a great see weekend. You. Bye. Bye.